This is some of the most polarizing music of our time. Beautiful, hyper-expressive, and futuristic to some, but nothing but pretentious noise-making for others. I'm the Classical Nerd, and today we're in for a doozy. We're looking at new complexity, surveying the five composers at its core, and trying to drill to the bottom of how and why this music sounds and looks the way it does. New complexity is music that sounds and looks like a lot. There's a lot of people who harbor a visceral dislike of this style of music precisely because there's so much information getting flung at you all of the time. Like, your brain can't process what's going on because every sound is nuanced and complex, and they're overlapped and dovetailed with one another, and as listeners, we can't be expected to keep up. A prevailing question is this. Does notational complexity equal abstract musical complexity? New complexity composers give performers pieces of music that are so detailed that traditional interpretive decision-making cannot be done. Taking this angle, new complexity is the end result of detail-oriented composers throughout history, like Leopold Godowski, Percy Granger, George Ligeti, and Yanis Xenakis, who all controlled the finest details of how a performer would play their music. This inverts the interpretive role of the performer. Instead of figuring out what to emphasize or add to a piece, they're forced to come to grips with what they need to take out in order to make it playable, while still having some fidelity to the score. Tom Johnson's novelty solo bass piece Failing from 1975 explores this same relationship. Although far from what we would call new complexity, it's written to be so difficult that performances will never be perfect, which is the very subject of the piece. New complexity composers are interested in the interaction between notated material and the live performer. Not complex music from a purely sonic perspective. If they were, they'd just feed their music into a computer, like Milton Babbitt did. But Babbitt was not of the new complexity, and new complexity is not computer music, although its composers write for synthesized sounds now and again. There's a strained affect that this notational busywork is going for, which forces performances to enter into a weird world where you can tell that the performer has practiced a lot, but the performance retains an edge-of-your-seat quality as though it were being sight-read. This is a natural extension of Western notational evolution. Consider rhythm. Time signatures and bar lines were devised to show regular beat structures. And so composers who are interested in unusual meters and rhythms have to resort to unconventional notations, such as irrational time signatures, where the denominator is the number of divisions of a whole note, which means tuplets get cut off halfway through and the music resets itself to a regular pulse on the ensuing downbeat. But even this technique relies on playing off of an expected regularity of pulse. In new complexity, the ways in which Western notation is inadequate are foregrounded. And this, by the way, is not unique to one postmodern trend. Scholars who spend their time transcribing music of the late medieval Ars Subtilior into modern notation run into the same problems. That music was written in a notation that allowed for unparalleled rhythmic complexity. Unsurprisingly, new complexity composers tend to express affinity for early music like this. The term new complexity gained traction in the 1980s in order to describe this style of music, prominently by musicologist Richard Toop in his article Four Facets of the New Complexity. Originally, Toop wanted to call his article Four Faces in the New England in reference to the members of the group who liked the music of Charles Ives. The problem is not all of the members of the group were English. Toop never took credit for the term new complexity, saying that he'd heard it from Roger Wright, who'd heard it from Nigel Osborne, and it can be traced all the way back to the music critic Harry Hulbreich, who apparently coined it back in 1978, a full decade prior to Toop's popularization of it. Toop championed composers who resisted being unceremoniously lumped together based on their music's surface quality. Toop failed in their minds to acknowledge the fundamental aesthetic differences between them, reducing them to nothing more than guys who wanted to squeeze as many notes onto a page as possible, maximizing the amount of information. The critique here is valid. New Complexity is often a school which really unusually is based on the visual element of these composers' scores, not anything we can hear. According to Toop, Brian Fernihow was the father of the movement, and its facets were Michael Fennessy, Chris Dinch, Richard Barrett, and James Dillon. This term has been associated with that generation of composers, and it has not rubbed off on their students. Take Haya Chernovan, 
who got her PhD at UC San Diego studying with Fernihau, who creates works which are difficult for performers and in which the notation imbues a sense of struggle. But her music doesn't look like her old teachers, and few if any, would call Chernivin a new complexity composer. Others of the school, if it can even be called that, are Roger Redgate, Klaus Hübler, and Klaus Stefan Mankopf. But these composers are beyond the scope of this video. I mean, good night in the morning is long enough already. At the heart of the new complexity is a shared interest in five things to various degrees, including extended playing techniques, extremely complicated rhythms through polymeter, nested tuplets, irrational time signatures, and being a continuation of tradition. In other words, modernist and not postmodernist. Connecting many but not all members are leftist politics, the writings of Walter Benjamin, affinity for Charles Ives, and the art of Roberto Mata and Francis Bacon. Yet many of the things on the surface that link these composers, an interest in microtones for instance, originate from different impulses. For Finnessy, it's to emulate non-Western music. For Dench, it's a general making strange. And for Barrett, it's to emulate Percy Granger's free music that was unconstrained by granulation into discrete pitches. The New Complexity School were British in origin, but spread all over the world in reaction to its musical conservatism. Fernihal left in the late 60s. Dench lives in Australia now and has considered himself a fully Australian composer since Brexit. And Barrett lives in Amsterdam. Finnessy stuck around. Despite disastrous conditions, he felt an obligation to stay, couching that decision in more political terms than artistic ones. Fernihau and Finnessy achieved some prominence in the 1970s in new music circles, and Fernihau's avant-garde dominance was so strong that he coordinated the composition program at the Biennial Darmstadt Summer Courses until 1996, cementing new complexity as a dominant idiom in contemporary music as composers who wrote in that style flocked to Darmstadt and won their top prizes. The very term new complexity gave its enemies something concrete to oppose, and the emergent German school of Neue Einfachheit, or New Simplicity, was happy to do just that. Wolfgang Riem, a major figure in Neue Einfachheit, and Brian Fernihau were two of the three keynote speakers in Darmstadt for the 1980 summer courses, and Fernihau came to oppose their aesthetics in writing. Some writers, however, invert this timeline, consider new complexity a reaction against whatever strands of simplicity brought Neue Einfachheit into the fold. So tied was new complexity to Darmstadt that in 1997, Mankamp thought that they could reasonably be called the second Darmstadt school. The original Darmstadt composers, in Mankopf's terms the first Darmstadt school, were all into serial music, and its possibilities of formalizing and organizing and manipulating music through various mathematical processes, and the equal inclusion of all parameters. Different analysts take different tacks as to the relationship between the total serialism of the 1950s and 1960s and the new complexity of the 1970s through the present. In particular, Fernihau's rhythmic procedures have a link to the complicated processes of the integral serialists, and Barrett calls himself a serialist. But for other writers, like Stuart Paul Duncan, new complexity was a rejection of serialists' mechanical approach to interpretation, where performers' only job is to render the music exactly as it appears on the page. The difficulty of talking about new complexity is that musical genres aren't supposed to be defined by the intricacy of their notation, and yet this is all that new complexity has going for it, to define it against that which is not new complexity. The assumption that new complexity was an outgrowth of serialism was the result of people looking at these dense scores and assuming that the only way somebody could produce something of the sort was if they were using a rigorous and systematized process. But complexity alone tells us nothing about how music is constructed or how it sounds. The complexity is a byproduct of something else, which differs between composers. The performer is paramount in new complexity. On some level, either the composer or the performer is forced to contend with some complicated system, and the excitement and drama of the pieces is to be found within that struggle. Composers have to be knowledgeable about every sound an instrument can make at any given time, and what notational choices can be made to get the performer in the right headspace for this. Fernihau's music has a lot of beams for this reason. Short note values imply speed, and the beaming implies connectivity. Renotating a piece like Unity Capsule at the quarter note level would make it likely to be played more moderately and interpreted as less continuous. That being said, let's get on to the composers of Toop's article, beginning with Brian Fernihau. Yeah. 
Bernie Howe was born in January 1943. Early on in bombed out England, he learned to play in dilapidated woodwinds, and at 11, he joined his Coventry School's brass band where he played the cornet and began composing. When he first heard Edgar Vrez's Octandre at 16, he said that he wore the record out playing it so much. He didn't understand it, but he knew that it was music. His parents were not that approving or encouraging of their son's efforts, which soon flowered at the Birmingham School of Music and then at the Royal Academy of Music. He butted up against an upper-class conservatism which led him to take his flute and pursue studies on the continent in 1968, first going to the Netherlands, studying with Tom DeLeu, and then to Switzerland, studying with Klaus Huber. Frenichau learned German not by any standard method, but poring over the writings of Goethe and using these as vocabulary lists. Formal study was for practical benefits because Frenichau had already developed quite a bit of his language through personal study of the music he liked. Pieces by Karl-Heinz Stockhausen and Pierre Boulez fascinated him, but since he didn't have a comprehensive understanding of their techniques, when he went to imitate their aesthetics, he took a surface-level concept and magnified it. His analysis of Anton Webern's music gave him an appreciation not for 12-tone music exactly, but for Webern's compact style. So Fernihau's early sonatas for string quartet from 1967 take Webern's legendary ephemerality and expand it into a 45-minute, 20-section piece where each section is self-contained. This was the impetus for his ongoing love of the string quartet. In addition to the sonatas, he's written six numbered quartets, one withdrawn, and four unnumbered works for the same ensemble, as Fernihau distinguishes between string quartets and works for string quartet. This complexity caps performability at a moderately sized chamber ensemble, and there's a good reason that much of Fernihau's more played stuff tops out the level of the string quartet. Huge pieces like Fire Cycle Beta were passion projects with little hope of performance when written. La Terre Autonome treats the orchestra as 101 soloists, and their parts are no easier than they would be in a solo work. Frenichau's insistence on transcendental complexity runs into a brick wall at this scale. His experience with the flute is useful for his earliest and in many ways most successful works, Cassandra's Dream Song and Unity Capsule, which exist at the boundaries of what humans can play. For Cassandra's Dream Song, Frenichau says that the notation, however dense it is, is not a one-to-one -one representation of the end product. A good performance is not about replicating everything, but about the attempt. Inevitable failings are just part of the sound world. Fernihau knew that he was calling for notes outside the instrument's range, things that were impossible to do at the same time, and other assorted things that only a flutist would know. The amount of information that Fernihau throws at the performer resists memorization. And in Unity Capsule, he takes every way sound can be made with a human on a flute and filters that through the composite instrument of flutist plus flute, an endless network of possibilities wrapped up in one instrument which explains the title Unity Capsule. For years I wondered what that meant. I didn't know until I researched this video. These works are polyphonicizations of single instruments or lines, and represent Fernihau's idea that performers are resonators for pieces. The notation is so important that Fernihau thinks through it first. Sketches in the traditional sense are not part of Fernihau's style. He also doesn't shy away from theatricality. The second of Fernihau's time and motion studies, a parody of British worker efficiency tests, is for cello, with a specific wiring and amplification to turn it into a music theater piece, although Fernihau would dispute that it is. Throughout Fernihau's string writing, he's interested in creating personalities, not unlike Elliot Carter did in his quartets. This is most prominent in Fernihau's string trio and sixth string quartet. While he nearly called the second of the eventual three time in motion studies as electric chair music, he didn't want to be too on the nose. In addition to a solo part that divorces left and right hands, the cellist has to operate foot pedals to affect electronics, which are also hooked up to their own body. 
Freddy Howe composes layers of material and applies filters through process or intuition to remove material from an underlying source and end up with a surface. A basic filter would be like having a sequence of notes and then the filter allows through certain notes that are in the filters. When you take this filtering technique and combine it with the parametric counterpoint of his early flute pieces, it results in what in 1991 he called interference form, where multiple layers interrupt one another constantly. Of all Ferninghouse notational practices, this is the most novel, because he'll notate these lines of wildly different characters on two staves and draw lines to show where one stops and the other starts. It's an ensemble piece compressed into a single instrument, and often something about the instruments determines the layering. In 1989's Tritico per GS, Ferninghouse starts by putting quiet, low-register glissandos on one staff and loud double stops with lots of vibrato on the other, and then shows where one note value is cut short in order to be interrupted. It's about interfering with gestures, which Ferninghouse treats as objects in themselves. The processes involved are so complex that when writing a piece, Ferninghouse may forget what they are and has to invent new ones that continue whatever surface-level texture he has going. Preserving that continuity, but exploring different processes that get him the same surface. Measures and bar lines represent barriers of potential energy states, so changing where those lie changes the performance. He composes algorithmically to create grids that underpin his music and has turned to a computer program called Patchwork to help keep track of these layers. Samuel Andreev has a great breakdown of how this works in the string trio. Although Ferninghau is known for a naughty pitch language, he's also not a composer who has always been concerned with pitch. He's described it as foregrounding a technique of unraveling, which is more crucial than what's undergoing the unraveling. Pitch is a secondary consideration to texture, so his music is more concerned with texture types than with writing pitches that constitute it. This allows Ferninghau to create what Andreev calls damaged structures, where a device compromises the music in some significant way. Ferninghau rejects the connection of his music with serialism because serialism is concerned with setting up a system of possibilities, which he does with patchwork to an extent, but serialism goes through every permutation which Ferninghau describes as totally alien to his style. He admits that his vast pre-compositional structures are almost nowhere to be found within the finished product. He particularly cites his solo violin piece Unsichtbare Farben, where the material is constantly fragmented by shifting between any number of simultaneously unfolding layers. Notated rhythm and meter is like a transliteration of a language into a writing system that's not built to handle it. Sure, you can try to write Chinese using the Latin alphabet, but unless you make significant alterations that account for things like tone, the script is not really going to work. Ferninghau's music is known for these irrational time signatures, where the denominator is an unusual value of a whole note. And for Ferninghau, these time signatures act as slightly more complicated tuplets. They first appear in 1981's Lemma Icon Epigram, later on than one might expect. For what it's worth, Ferninghau is entirely capable of singing these rhythms, which is like... How? Performers get around Ferninghau's notation by simplifying things, rebarring measure, feeling every tuplet in new rhythm as a tempo change, and so on. Then performers only have to recall the correct tempi for each of these changes. Ferninghau doesn't like this, and for good reason. It not only reduces the complexity that the performer has to deal with when interacting with his scores, but it also destroys the feeling of continuity that he implies by the notation he chooses. He knows there are simpler ways to get what he wants, but he also wants to be able to be surprised by his own music through the performer's interactions with it. Yet performers, especially in chamber music contexts where communication and cohesion are critical, they painstakingly annotate and renotate these scores. Irving Nardetti and his eponymous quartet love playing Ferninghau's music, but there's more than a hint of trepidation for them when it comes to how Ferninghau feels like he has to write his scores. They have to renotate it for ensemble cohesion, and the end result is a version of the score and parts that doesn't communicate exactly the same thing. On the other hand, it is playable. A string quartet, no matter its caliber, has to do whatever it can to make sure that they're together, and the radical alterations of their parts render pieces that prize a style of accuracy that Ferninghau doesn't care for. Consider his comments about his guitar piece, Hutze Schatten Zwei. Ferninghau said that he was after the creation of polyphonic continuity while constraining players to realize the notated material in ways which frequently go counter to their instinctive... These quotes are so long. Instinctive feel of what would be natural. There. Got it. Yet even though his music is difficult, it is idiomatic. Ferninghau refers to a counterpoint between perceived oral complexity and the actual performative 
difficulty at any given moment. Anybody who plays an instrument will know that there are things that sound and look really impressive to outsiders, but are really easy to perform. My mom used to think that me crossing my hands when practicing a piano piece was just the coolest looking thing, and it's super duper easy. Not that it doesn't take a long time to learn a Fernie Howe piece. Percussionist Stephen Schick estimated that it took 1,200 hours of practice from the time he got the score to Bone Alphabet to his premiering performance in February 1992. If you didn't eat, sleep, or do anything for 50 straight days, that's the level of commitment required. Fernie Howe sees this as an upside by eliminating performers who are not willing to put in the work. On the flip side is a huge time commitment for not that many performances? Like, performers who commission for anyhow know what they're getting into and likely wouldn't be able to perform them enough to recoup their losses. Schick took about nine months practicing it and only felt it worthwhile after about 30 performances. But that's gonna differ depending on who you are and what the piece is. Klaus Huber helped Fernie Hauck get academic jobs, first in Freiburg, Germany in 1973, where he spent 13 years as a part-time lecturer, and after a brief stopover in The Hague at the Royal Conservatory, he came to the United States and has had two full-time teaching posts in California, first at San Diego and currently at Stanford. What makes him attractive as a teacher is his steadfast refusal to teach students to write new complexity, not least because he doesn't identify with new complexity. Fernie Howe contrasts fidelity with exactitude, such that a good performance can take liberties so long as the performer is trying their best to be faithful to the score. The pursuit of accuracy is more important than being accurate. Michael Finnessy is another English composer born only three years after Fernie Howe. His style comes from an extension of his performance. His earliest memories were at the piano, and he backed into her career in music. His father was a documentary photographer. While never taught what composition was, he was interested in modern music since about the age of eight, and asked for the score of Charles Ives' Concord Sonata as a 12th birthday present, man after my own heart. He trained as a teacher, and when he had to teach a music course, his sight singing was so good that he was told he should apply to music school when he got into the Royal College of Music. But he didn't know the first thing about theory. He entered college able to identify a fugue, but unable to tell you what the tonic and dominant were. He never learned how to play the piano in the traditional sense either, preferring to spread his hands out over the keyboard instead of keeping them in a central position. His ferocious sight-reading skills made him a natural rehearsal pianist, which informed his compositions. He was asked to play huge orchestral scores and enjoyed the challenge of turning the piano into an orchestra. And when one can read orchestral scores at the piano, having a lot of notes and information for a solo piano isn't a whole lot more difficult. I'd argue it's actually less. Finissi's music is primarily for his own instrument, where he's produced a series of long and complicated works. When not fulfilling a commission, he writes for the piano. Like for anyhow, Finissi burst onto the scene in the late 1960s with a piano suite entitled Songs 5 through 9, and with increasing reputation in the 1970s, a decade where he spent every free moment composing. His works are often thought of autobiographically, as he finishes up one piece and then moves on to the next one without a break. In early years, he would dovetail the end of one piece into the beginning of the next. He wrote seven piano concerti from 1975 to 1981, two of which are for solo piano, continuing in the tradition of imitating an entire orchestra on a single instrument, which was pioneered by Charles Valentin Alcan, one of Finnessy's heroes. Each concerto adopts a completely different attitude towards the relationship between soloist and ensemble. Thank you. 
However, what limited fame he had in new music circles was off of the back of a monstrous piano suite called English Country Tunes. In 50 minutes, Finnessy contrasts his typically violent textures with smooth, simple melodies. Distraught over not having achieved a wider appeal, he spent time in Australia in 1980, and his music subsequently opened up to a wider range of influences. Finnessy likes folk music from all over the world, and his suite, where fake folk melodies are stretched, distorted, and destroyed to give an intentionally frenetic quality to the music, also serves as a commentary on contemporary English society and the perils of industrialization. He likes folk tunes with irregular pulse groupings, with a special interest in those of Eastern Europe, the Transcaucasus, the music of the Kurds, and Aboriginal Australian folk tunes. For him, it represents the origins of music free from the trappings of westernized music making. Many of those same impulses exist in his work outside solo piano, and in their adoption of various folk musics are more inclined to explore microtones, something that the piano just can't do. Quarter tones themselves become a point of interest and obsession in their gradual inclusion or elimination over the course of a work. Typical features of Finnessy's music are a focus on the piano, very long cycles of music that sometimes take upwards of a decade for him to compose, avoidance of extended techniques, especially for the piano, a borrowing and synthesis of other composers' material through his unique approach to transcription, more on that in a bit, grace note figurations so vast as to adopt a kind of spatial notation, openly aggressive and violent figures, use of extreme register, and tuplets that, while complex in their own right, rarely go more than one level deep, unlike the nested tuplets of Brian Fernihow. Like Fernihow, Finnessy is interested in the psychology of notation and how composers' choices impact performers. Finnessy thinks of music as a series of processes, with clearly audible forms that discard received tradition. Fernihow plans his forms in advance, while Finnessy figures it out as he goes along. Finnessy also rejects the orthodoxy of these various schools. He never went through a serialist phase and loves romantic composers like Tchaikovsky. He feels that extended techniques draw too much attention to themselves as sounds, and not a part of the discourse. As a pianist, he felt stupid having to reach inside the piano and pluck something. He had to do this while he was a rehearsal pianist with the London Contemporary Dance Theatre in the 1970s, which also exposed him to a lot of the minimalism that was coming out of the United States at the time. He and Fernio, he said, were derided as these unplayable composers up through the 70s, at which point performers who were looking for a challenge began to play their works. But only a small fraction of performers who are interested in new music would touch new complexity with a 10-foot pole, hence the close relationships that these composers have to individual performers, small ensembles, and in Finnessy's case, himself as soloist for much of his output. Returning to this important idea of transcription, this takes after Busoni's ideas of the same thing, that all music is transcription, much as writing down a thought is a transcription of a thought in the abstract. The act of creation, of formalizing one's ideas on a page, necessarily filters them. He has little interest in generating his own material, and indeed casts doubt on the idea that one can have a truly original idea in music, because music is, in Finnessy's words, socially determined. Finnessy makes a distinction between transcription and arrangement. The latter is something that's a little more pre-planned, so his Gershwin arrangements have a title that gives away a crucial difference between them and, say, the Verdi transcriptions. Finnessy's transcriptions engage in a vast amount of meta-commentary, requiring listeners to come to his music with several prerequisites just to understand what's going on. Like his early piano work Romeo and Juliet are Drowning mashes together music from Berlioz and Berg, engaging in a process of objectification and recontextualization. And throughout his career, he has written pieces in homage to some of his favorite iconoclastic composers. These include Ives, Conlon Nankaro, and Percy Granger. By far his biggest transcription project is his reinterpretation of Verdi's opera tunes in the monumental Verdi transcriptions. Even the stuff that sounds so very foreign to Verdi, such as the series of violent, low-register chords that start the piece, are somehow pulled from Verdi's material. To fantasy, this seat-of-one's-pants approach to transcription is intended to retain some something of the original flavor of the pieces that he's transcribing. It's kind of like this meme about chicken nuggets. Once Finnessy had gained more recognition in the late 80s and early 90s, he began using his music to speak out more on issues deep to him, particularly at the intersection of his leftist politics and homosexuality. Take Stanley Stokes' East Street 1836 and Nine Romantics, pieces which come around the turn of the decade, the AIDS-inspired song cycle Unknown Ground from 1992, 
and the orchestral Speak Its Name from 1996. There's an exclamation point in the title. It try to get that across, which is a collage of material from gay artists superimposed over the emergence of a single melody over the course of its 22 minute runtime. The five and a half hour long history of photography and sound, at the center of which is a movement called 17 Immortal Homosexual Poets, covering a whopping 40 minutes, sums up many of the strands of Finnessy's career. He feels alienated from society for his politics and for his sexuality. This is what led him to explore folk musics from outside England before returning to English folk music with a critical lens, which is what had led to the English country tunes many years before. Finnessy's status as a piano folk artistic outsider has drawn comparisons to Kaikosru Sorabji, another reclusive gay composer, and Finnessy's music makes use of Sorabjian tendencies in the use of this sign to show that the music is up an octave, and also in the vastness of his canvases and uses of tuplets and filigree. Finnessy also wrote an opera, he calls them stage works, called Shameful Vice, about the last stage of Tchaikovsky, who he has interpreted as a martyr. His research led him to the conclusion that Tchaikovsky's death was an ordered suicide. Shameful Vice is organized into 14 sections that mirror the Stations of the Cross. As Finnessy has had a deep engagement with religious music, not least of which is due to the influence of his music director life partner, Philip Adams. Finnessy has a strong attraction to experimental film and has even taught film techniques at Sussex University. This helps explain the dramatic breadth of his works, as he often makes comparison between cinematography and composition. However, he rejected his works for film and theater, as his admitted stubbornness butted up against others. Eventually, he learned that he just wasn't that good of a collaborator. Rather, he wants to emphasize the human element of performance, removing art from being put on some pedestal, and as he says, making art out of a part of people's lives. While Fernieho is concerned with the technical side of his place in history, Finnessy's less structured approach makes his social commentary more approachable. Drawing upon the influence of Ives, Finnessy doesn't believe that any music can exist as pure music. Therefore, he leans into programs and politics. Finnessy knows that contemporary music with a political bent will be preaching to the choir, and a pretty small choir at that, so he focuses the political elements of his music when working with amateur groups. Orchestras, he said, deserve to be extinct for their intimidation of composers, and he's written relatively rarely for them. He considers his musical meaning in the intervals and the relative density or sparseness of his textures, with timbre a lesser consideration. <laughs> Dench was born in London in 1953. Early on, he was banned from listening to popular music like the Beatles out of a moral panic against rock. And when he finally did, he hated them, preferring the larger canvases of Fish and the Grateful Dead. He began composing at eight, informed by his father's eccentric musical tastes. In 1969, Dench won third prize in the Southern Television Young Composers Competition out of 750 entries, but his work was not played on the air as promised. Dench figured it had to do with his piece's polytonality, and as figures of the conservative establishment doubted Dench's bona fides, Dench heard a broadcast of Jean Baraquet's mammoth serialist piano sonata and immediately took it into his sound world. Ives was another major influence, even though Dench doesn't identify a stylistic overlap, he sees a similarity in their approach. For one thing, in many of Ives' masterpieces, the three places in New England among them, there are a lot of musical lines going on at the same time, but rarely does anything truly line up for more than a moment here or there. But the biggest influence is that of Scriabin, whose music, he said, stopped him in his tracks when he first heard the Opus 74 preludes, and the early post-Scriabin futurists of the Soviet Union have loomed large for him. The jazz fusion of Robert Greitinger's piece City of Glass is another piece that Dench likes to cite in interviews. And because he found work in record shops, not only does he have an enormous CD collection to this day, but he became a fan of a wider circle than just that of contemporary classical, out to The Can and Miles Davis. He was a Frank Zappa fan once, but found Zappa's, quote, gender politics to be so repellent that it outweighed their compositional interest. Dinch sought what he called a punk modernism, which started out in reaction to what he felt was an English bloodless modernism that emulated the works of Peter Maxwell Davies. He felt a kinship with punk's antagonism towards mainstream English culture, and this meant little to no interest in making performers comfortable. This anti-English sentiment may have something to do with his identity as a real Francophile. He considers himself self-taught because he never formally studied composition, but he had a few lessons, which he thought were horrible experiences. 
He finds academic things tedious and never sought a university post. He just doesn't think composition can be taught, and he takes the view that trying to teach it can be intrusive. Nonetheless, one of the major downsides of a non-university post is a lack of access to things like advanced music technology. Applying his ideas of musical originality and complexity in a music tech space would lead to music that, in a sense, composes itself outwards in response to the events of a particular performance. He doesn't like electronic media because he likes the differences in performances that humans provide. He was briefly a member of Cornelius Cardew's Scratch Orchestra in the early 70s, but had to distance himself from it because he wanted to retain his belief in the power of notated music. The first piece he felt was truly his was Helical, written around the time he first met Michael Finnessy. Dench uses music to illuminate what it means to be human. So with Fernie Howe's rise in the early 1970s and Dench's subsequent interest in the new worlds that Fernie Howe was exploring, particularly with his piece Transit, Dench found, much as Fernie Howe himself did, that English new music specialists became less interested in playing his music right when he was starting to get some more performances. Like Fernie Howe, Dench loves the flute and likes writing polyphonically for monophonic instruments. Repelled by Thatcherite politics, Dench abandoned Britain for unaffordable Tuscany in 1987, only to move to West Berlin for a year right before the fall of the Berlin Wall, and then finally to Australia on Christmas 1989 initially due to his then-marriage to Australian flutist Laura Chislett. He was shocked upon arriving in Australia that the notion that all artists were left-leaning to far-left in their politics was only a reality for continental Europe and parts of the U.S. In Australia, there was a pre-existing antagonism towards him and his music. He cites the Adelaide Pastoral Company's hostility to modernism that resulted in the complete absence of state funding for his works between 1994 and 2011, which stalled his career. He became an Australian citizen in 1992, and after several decades there, Dench has settled into the Victorian town of Ballarat with his wife, the singer and musicologist Catherine Sullivan, whom he met in 2003. Australia's leading new music ensemble, Elysian, has commissioned him on a number of occasions. Like Ives, Dench has had a number of day jobs and has gone through many periods of writing music in the off hours, such as when he was working for the Australian Taxation Office. Dench regards notation as something of a necessary evil. He uses notation to, in his words, engage the performer by implying a world dominated by interpretive rubato. Notation is not just reflexively seeing a note and playing a note, but a series of capsules of information that must be decoded and digested into a performance through the medium of the performer. He encourages creative decoding of his notation, adopted around the time of his piece Ixlands, the first of his pieces where he considered himself a truly Australian composer. For Dench, the music sits behind the notation, relying on the performer as interpreter to make meaningful decisions about the score. The goal is not to overload the performer with an anxiety-inducing level of information, but just to put in enough detail to overcome the inevitable loss of information as material is notated, engraved, interpreted, and finally listened to. Each step of that process differs a bit from a composer's initial vision, to the end result into the listener's ear, so the composer has to notate more than they might otherwise choose to do in order to accommodate and anticipate this loss of information. Dench thinks about his music not in notation, but time-space, how long something will last after the second. And once a section is written like this, he'll go back over it and put it into more traditional notation. In Ixlands, he simplified this rhythmic filtering and presented performers with something less intimidating than something that he would have done previously, which is why this is a turning point. Despite the fantastic lily pond work of his engraver, Andrew Bernard, his handwritten scores fit his music better than industry standard typesetting, which one of his PhD examiners complained about. His process does not play well with software. Nonetheless, his music is the simplest looking of the new complexity, as he doesn't go outside what he considers a tame notation toolbox. He combines mensural and proportional notation in an attempt to make his music easier to decode. Three centimeters equals one second, regardless of tempo. Because nature does not have steady beats, iterative subdivisions, and Dinch's music seeks to replicate nature, his notation is what he calls irreducible. Everything needs to be notated in full. 
Dench distinguishes complexity of process from complexity of finished music, engaging with the material at every step of the process, and thinking of layers of embedded structures, where small bits of music are related to all the layers around it, which in turn build up to form an entire piece, guaranteeing a grammatical unity for a piece while allowing it to be truly long. His piano sonata is over an hour and a half, and although it is split up into movements, they can't be extracted without Dinch's express written consent. Even visually, you can see these long arches in his music, which he thinks of as fractal-like structures, and he's only controlling the degree of granularity, akin to sharpening the resolution of an image. Fernihal regards Dinch's works as a flow of non-objects, which in Dinch's mind is a staggered or simultaneous present consisting of a meta-stacked time. You'll find no steady meter or pulse in his music. In this layered temporal environment, he finds a lot in common with Ives. But the higher resolution a notational solution is, the more granular it is in his words, the more that Dench has found his performers have been reduced in their freedoms, an inverse to the Ferning Howian approach. Dench has withdrawn a guitar piece for being too hard, not unplayable, but hard enough that it sounds like it's difficult, and Dench doesn't want that. You can see now why these composers all object to being lumped in with one another. Although a fan and acquaintance of Xenakis, the Greek composer's mathematically rigorous music was just a starting point. Dinch wouldn't have had such an affinity for Xenakis' music if he didn't hear an expressive human element in the resulting work. Dinch's attempts at doing something similar by using naturally occurring numerological series ended up less successful because there was no human impulse embedded in there. Applying natural phenomena to music didn't work for him. So Dench invented what he calls a geomatic approach. This approach imports musical meaning from non-musical domains, creating a musical grammar that is disconnected from historical practices. His titles give insight into these relationships. Inspired by Tifereth by the Portuguese composer Emmanuel Nunes, which turned names into numbers by formula and using those numbers as raw material, Dench does the same thing, converting the rules of language into numbers that had no relation to natural processes, but because they come from something, they have these internal connections and symmetries. This allows Dench to link titles into his pieces by using them as raw material. Dench encodes his music with levity and an affinity for science and science fiction concepts. The idea of science fiction music is that sci-fi is to fiction as his music is to the rest of new music. And he's also always using science and science fiction as a point of inspiration. He's obsessed with how pieces end and has taken to writing long works so as to prevent pieces from immediately preceding or succeeding his works, pieces at least half a concert long, which Richard Toop called cyclomania. His piano sonata is based on the life cycle of the physical universe. He rejects the new complexity label as much as he rejects another label that's thrown in his direction, that of maximalism. This means that while he approaches his pieces in the same way, details are lost from one piece to the next, and he has a difficult time resuming work on a piece if he has to stop, hence his habit of meticulously storing all of his sketches so he can reverse engineer what he was doing if he has to take a break from a piece. On form, Dinch says it's all rhythm. The fractal-like character of his forms means that the difference between one local rhythm and the form of a whole piece is a question of blowing one up or shrinking one down to get the other, which allows Dench to write long works that hang together by virtue of a broad self-similarity. The coherency of a piece, to Dench, must be in the same relative level of crudeness or sophistication across various musical parameters. That is to say, if you're dealing with an advanced and very microtonal pitch language, it should follow that your rhythmic language ought to not sound like Haydn or Mozart. Like, that would just be kind of bizarre. Welsh composer Richard Barrett, born in Swansea in 1959, came to music quite late. Initially in the fields of genetics and microbiology, Barrett's compositional career started slowly in fits and starts up through the mid-1980s. Because of his outsider status, Barrett didn't have access to advanced electronic studios, so he made electronic music through guitar pedals, rudimentary Casio keyboards, and cassette machines. Barrett found creative ways to use this rudimentary technology, forming FERT with Paul Obermeyer in 1986. For its first seven years, FERT remained at this crude level of technology, and they've retained the idea of doing advanced things 
with rudimentary materials ever since. One of these techniques was taking the output of a cassette and routing it through their sampling keyboards. Barrett and Obermeyer had no way of knowing what was going to come out when they did this, and over many years they've trained themselves to react musically to unexpected events at the rate of several times per second. His work with Ferd has led him to classify electronic instruments as either active, which require performer input to sound, reactive, where the performer manipulates a steady stream of sonic information, passive, where the performer doesn't have to do anything, and autonomous, where the instruments act sort of as their own performers. This unconventionality, when applied to something like a standard MIDI controller, would map MIDI information of, for instance, how hard you press a note down, which is called velocity, and apply that to how much the pitch of a sample is warped. At Darmstadt in 1986, Barrett said that he was still beginning to define his compositional and paracompositional aims. But by the end of the decade, Barrett's music had made it to Australia, where the newly formed Elysian Ensemble took it up, and their support and commissions unlocked his latent creativity. He only wrote 15 pieces between 1982 and 1990, for about two pieces per year over that eight-year span. His paces increased considerably, with 40 double bars under his belt from 2010 to 2018 alone, and those were longer works. In that time, he also submitted a doctoral thesis to the University of Leeds, an odd career move, especially since Barrett wasn't after an academic job. He just wanted space to organize his thoughts in a formal and recognizable way. Uniquely among these composers, Barrett is unashamedly serialist. This label is what most of New Complexity shuns. Barrett speaks of resisting the evaporation of meaning, positioning him as squarely a modernist and against postmodernism, which does jive with the rest of them, and he works by taking a musical parameter dividing it up into sections, and then moving through those sections at meaningful moments within a piece. Serialism guarantees exhaustivity. If you set up some process, it's only serial if you cover every possibility that that process outputs and try to do so in an even-handed way. He's critical of the early techniques of trying to serialize dynamic level and the assumption of octave equivalency, that is that all C's or all E's or F sharps are the same thing, and the imperceptibility of serial procedures in complex textures. Because of this, he traces his serial lineage through the work of Karlheinz Stockhausen, as well as, of all things, 1970s rock. Stockhausen was an influential character for a lot of rock's more forward-thinking ensembles, most famously the Beatles, who put him on the Sgt. Pepper's cover, because, as Barrett notes, the instruments of contemporary music and rock music had a great degree of overlap. His composed music often deals with live instruments and electronics, which leaves it open to the same amplification and processing techniques found in someone like Brian Eno, one of Barrett's hundreds of pop music influences. Like Finnessy, Barrett reworks and recomposes using other composers' materials, in a way I find more direct and audible than much of Finnessy, and where it's subsumed by these crashing textures. Barrett particularly likes the F above middle C as a starting and ending point for a lot of his processes. I, I can't tell you why, because I'm trying to keep it a family-friendly channel, all sources are, as usual, down in the description. In the contemporary realm, another important influence is Yanis Xenakis. For Barrett, Xenakis' statistical approach to composition makes more sense on a large scale than a buildup of various serial structures, in which, by definition, occur on a small scale. Barrett conceives of music as existing in a multidimensional conceptual space, which allows for a fusion of the disparates between free improvisation and a strict, highly structured serialism as two ends of a spectrum. Pathways through these spaces are determined by probability, something else that Xenakis like to use. Barrett applies probability to create a heterophonic texture, a texture common to non-Western musics where multiple variations of a melody will go on at exactly the same time. This removes the need for harmonic structure and allows different things to unfold at different rates in different performances, which is perfect for improvisation, and also widely adaptable through algorithm. Barrett refers to this system as possessing several different levels of pitch focus. Applying this idea to rhythm allows for degrees of rhythmic precision or imprecision, and thus explains Barrett's affinity for complex rhythms, nested tuplets, and the irrational subdivisions common to new complexity. In contrast to the idea of complexity, 
Barrett says that his music is as simple as it can be under the circumstances, and he's always trying to find ways of making them simpler without losing that which they attempt to express. Barrett works in the simultaneous streams of improvisation and composition, and while he deals with them separately, he sees an underlying unity beneath them, improvisation as a method of composition. His improvisatory scores, particularly his mostly conductorless codex series, Barrett writes scores that intend to focus a performer's attention in such a way that it encourages them to do something different than they'd usually do if left to improvise. Codex 5 from 2007 is constructed to be available to amateur musicians as well as professional ones. However, improvisation is not something one can do in Barrett's work at sight. Performers still have to rehearse, if only to make sure that they're on the same page and are approaching the performance operating under the same rules and game plan. Barrett talks about radically idiomatic instrumentalism, his words, in which the materials of a work have their origins in the consideration of the instrument, its history, and its performer. He also likes writing work complexes, which are comprised of many smaller pieces that can be combined in different ways to form a larger whole. An example is his piece World Line, completed in 2014, which consists of five individual pieces of music that can be reshaped. Notation in Barrett's work is the medium of communication between composer and performer, with seated improvisation finding a balance between notated music and improvised material in ways where notated material influences improvisations. Barrett, more so than Finessey or Dench, is interested in the intersection of music and politics in relation to a class-based worldview. In that sense, Barrett continues the legacy of Cornelius Cardew. Barrett seeks to write music that encodes what he calls a radical political position, but not through the use of text, like punk music would. He's not sure it's possible to do this, but he feels like it's worthwhile to ask and pursue. Unlike Fennessy, Barrett's use of non-Western instruments isn't to evoke non-Western music, but to distance the music from any one tradition altogether. Modernism in Barrett is continually an ongoing project. Dylan, the only Scottish composer cited in Toop's Facets of New Complexity, was born in Glasgow in October 1950 and spent his first nine years there before moving to London. This was late enough that he retained a certain Scottishness about himself, and he got started in music through playing in traditional bagpipes ensembles. He was also in an R&B band called Influx. His early life consisted of disaffected intellectual wandering, knowing that he wanted to be a composer, but without any confidence in the academic path of composition to get him to where he wanted to go. His personal library fills to the brim with books on all manner of subjects. I like to think that mine is too, but they're all over here because you gotta have the look. Like other new complexity composers, Dylan did not directly come to music through higher education, instead studying art at the University of Glasgow starting in 1968. His interest in Indian classical music led him to study it at the University of Kiel with Punita Gupta, and they also studied acoustics and linguistics in London in the 1970s. While Dylan studied music in many different forms, he was never taught composition, and his independent streak manifested in a strikingly original language that won several prizes through the late 1970s and early 1980s. Along with Fernie, how he taught in Darmstadt throughout the 1980s, and from 2007 to 2014, he was a professor at the University of Minnesota. Because of his variegated studies, Dylan, like the other New Complexity composers, pulls from a multitude of points of inspiration, from ancient poetry to physics. And because he didn't learn composition in a university setting, he was not exposed to serialism until he was well into his career. And it didn't affect his thinking because he wasn't sure that the techniques of serialism actually legitimately forced composers to contend with all of their material's inherent possibilities, which had been serialism's basic promise. What he wanted to instead was to reclaim musical meaning. Dylan's work, especially early on, is characterized by density and ferocity, Two prefers to the aggression of his work, influenced as it was by Varese and Zanakis, but it has settled into a more refined world ever since, a formal elegance that Fernihal linked to Dylan's interest in spectralist tendencies. Spectralism, a separate mid-century school of thought, used instruments to reinforce partials of overtone series of certain fundamental frequencies, essentially recreating the sound of a single instrument with a large ensemble. Given his knowledge of acoustics, if any of these composers were to overlap with spectralism, it would be Dylan. Take his ensemble work Überschreiten, which translates to overstepping, 
where the initial material is a harmonic series of an E, and distance from that series gives Dylan something approaching dissonance. The harmonic series is used as a kind of found object that Dylan can play with by going outside of it, investigating its properties in a separate way from its historical meaning and usage and influence on the way that Western music operates. Dylan's goal is to write music that is so layered and nuanced that listeners can always find something new in it. He likens the process to building a gothic cathedral where architectural feats could go unnoticed by parishioners for years or decades on end. He thinks of his music like rivers, hence the title of his mammoth project, Nine Rivers. Like Finnessy, Dylan writes works containing pieces for all sorts of ensembles, which can operate on their own or in the context of an evening-length work. Pieces may be grouped under the same title, but contain individual movements of vastly different instrumentations. Dylan's success has mostly been on continental Europe, and much less in the United Kingdom, and his titles are intentionally obscure, in contrast to Dinch's use of titles as a structural element of composition. Dylan's approach allows for the kinds of very stark limitations that wouldn't make sense for the aesthetics of other composers discussed in this video. Not only is he very open about his use of clear-cut formal designs that link to the past, but in his sixth string quartet, he has a whole long section where the ensemble only plays within the span of a single whole tone. He tends to think of music in terms of its relative smoothness or turbulence, as opposed to the more traditional view of composition as tension and resolution in different forms. So we can write music with a clear narrative structure, but achieved not through continuity of one thing to the next, but in engaging with disruption from one movement to another. Directionality in terms of discontinuity, in his words. Dylan is pleasantly surprised that contemporary music has managed to survive the onslaught of other outlets of human attention, and regards his music as the defense of something that the world cannot afford to lose. More than most of the modernists of new complexity, Dylan understands the need for clarity of structure while also talking about music in terms of things like overlapping braids, a metaphor he developed while braiding his then young daughter's hair. We are not far enough removed from the new complexity to see the end of these composers' careers or their ongoing impacts on the development of Western music moving forward. To wrap this up, I want to underscore, again, how each of these composers, while disliking the term new complexity, end up writing music that, on the surface level, looks similar, and this visual similarity is what holds them together as a school or movement. While there is some overlap in how these composers sound, digging into why they write what they do reveals interlocking constellations of impulses, aesthetics, and viewpoints. And even if it's not music that you like, or it's music that you think you don't like. It's not music that can be dismissed out of hand. If you don't like one composer, you can't discount another composer just because of that. It's a movement of great intellectual depth and rigor, and its composers are well worth a deeper understanding. <laughs>